everyone, I am Rebecca from Cheminits and I'm here with my super big PVC pipe nitty naughty because today we're gonna dye some self-striping yarn. Now, in more recent videos when I make my really long hanks, I've used a warping board that I made myself. But I know that not everyone who wants to dye their own self-striping yarn has access to a warping board and making a really long nitty naughty out of PVC pipe is really, really accessible. I'll try to put a list of all of the pieces that you need here on the side of the video, but we have two two foot sections of half inch PVC pipe. We have four six inch sections, uh, two of these T brackets, four caps, and then one straight extender. And typically at your home improvement store, you can find this in two foot segments. So you really just need to get one piece cut. Uh, and then, well, you'd be ready to go. I'll link to the video where I talk about making the Nitty Naughty and another one about winding yarn on the Nitty Naughty down in the video description as well. But typically, uh, to make a four foot skein, you would want a one foot section here. So since I have a four foot section here in the middle, we're gonna be making a 12 foot skein. So it's gonna be really, really long. <laughs> This angle is so weird. Now, before we go and talk about the luxurious yarn we're gonna do today, I wanna to give a huge shout out and thank you to my lab partner, Kara. Kara, thank you so much for being my lab partner for today's episode of Dye Fault Weekly. Today, we are going for luxury with Wool to Dye Force Tibetan 3-ply yarn. This yarn is 65% superwash merino, 20% silk, 15% yak. And oh, I wish that you could buy more long hank options. Uh, there is a fingering weight 7525 sock you can get from Wool to Dye For in, I forget if it's five or six meter skeins, but the technique I'm doing today will help us create a long skein so we can make self-striping out of whatever base we want. I spent a little while attempting to show how I would wind the yarn onto the Nitty Naughty, but this Nitty Naughty is both so large that it's hard to keep in frame and the yarn itself is so thin that I think that it's hard to see. And it was challenging for me to both talk and try to demonstrate this at the same time. <laughs> Which is why I'm showing things really sped up right here. The whole process of creating your own big skein for self-striping yarn can take a lot of time. This is a labor of love and something that you want to do because you want to create that perfect self-striping yarn yourself. But in watching me do this, you can imagine that it would be really hard to scale this up with this technique. Where I can dye three skeins of a yarn at one time using other techniques, for this, I would have to prepare each large skein individually. And so each skein has that 20, 30 minutes of winding the yarn at the beginning and then winding the yarn at the end. And so that's something to consider when you see how dyers may price their self-striping yarn. All right, here is a much older video of me winding some really thick yarn onto a Nitty Naughty. And I didn't secure the end to it, so I don't know why, but I'm showing how you want to wrap the yarn around and I had the camera at a really weird angle. So that was hard to show, but that is just one full rotation. Now I will actually secure that end in between the PVC pipe and another part. Uh, but this is showing not the technique I use. Normally I move the Nitty Naughty in my hands, um, but I wanted to exaggerate putting the yarn around so you could get a sense of how, uh, <laughs> how this all works. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna show it from another angle. Oh my gosh, this video is ancient. <laughs> uh, another angle so that way you can see it. I'm going real, real slow. I did not secure that end. Uh, but this whole way that I'm wrapping the yarn around also applies if you're using a much larger Nitty Naughty. But again, normally I hold it from that center bar and I kind of like move the Nitty Naughty while holding the yarn steady and that's a little easier, but I think it's a little easier to demonstrate how you're actually wrapping the yarn around with something like this. And so anyway, I hope that this helps. And now back to my super long skein. Oof, my arms are tired. <laughs> now I do plan to add more ties to this, 
But I just wanted to demonstrate again to hope that this shows how things are wrapped around that if I am to remove one of these links, this opens this up. So then we have our super, super long skein. Oh man. <laughs> and I could say that it is longer than I am tall. Um, but anyway, I'm gonna go put some more ties onto this uh, so then we can go pre-soak the yarn. Now, I did make one error earlier in this video. Uh, four times four is 16. Uh, I was making an approximately 16 foot skein. But here you can see that the length is closer to seven feet, four inches. So really, we're about 14 and a half feet around versus 16, and some of that is because of the tension. When you're winding the yarn around a knitting knotty, it gets a little bit stretched. So the final length is a bit shorter, but that isn't a big deal. Yeah, I, I just wanted to measure this so that way when I go and swatch it, you know approximately how long my skein was. So if you want to get a similar kind of result, then you can. I want to pre-soak the yarn overnight in some plain tap water. Uh, and this is so that way we can make sure that our silk content gets nice and saturated. Now it would be okay in theory um, if, oh, I don't know. We just want to avoid any dry patches on here uh, because we want to try to get the color I still want it to be tonal because it's a hand dyed self striping yarn, but uh, I want that silk content to have time to get saturated. And so an overnight silk is always a way to be safe because if we take a closer look in here, just from quickly spraying it, you can see that we've got some dry areas in here. It's not soaking up the liquid that, that fast. So I will come and squeeze it. Uh, every so often just to try to help things get nice and saturated. But I'll see you tomorrow so we can start dyeing it. For our self-striping yarn today, I pulled three of my favorite colors in Derma Acid Dyes Caribbean Blue, Purple Pop, and Radioactive. I put on my deluxe rubber respirator mask, safety glasses, and gloves. And this is the safety equipment I wear whenever I'm gonna deal with dry dye powders. And then I weighed out a quarter gram, 0.25 grams, of each of these three colors to use for our three stripes. Now, both radioactive and purple pop are colors that break. Uh, purple pop has a fluorescent pink with a little bit of blue, and radioactive has a fluorescent yellow with a little bit of blue. And in both of these cases, I want to add a little bit more blue to make the green a little bit greener and our purple pop a little bit purplier. Um, so I plan to do some mixing once we have everything all dissolved. I used hot tap water to dissolve our dyes, not worrying about the volume. I'm going to play with these colors by feel in a moment. And when I say dye by feel, I mean dye by feel. I'm going to take some blue on the spoon, add it to the green, some blue on the spoon, add it to the purple. And we're going to stir things up to see where we are. So our purple, I should have tapped these before, that does give us a more purple colorway and adding that little bit of blue, which again, I should have showed you what they looked like before, is making the radioactive look a little bit more like Jacquard Chartreuse, which is a fluorescent green that I personally like the tone of a little bit more. But now I'm gonna set these colors aside and we can start prepping our yarn. I brought over the yarn that we pre-soaked overnight and squeezed out a lot of that pre-soak water. So that way I could start arranging this in the way that I want to dye. And now I am having an internal debate. Three stripes or four stripes? Because I could dye the yarn so that way we have three relatively equal stripes, purple, green, blue, purple, green, blue. Or I could arrange the yarn so we have four stripes, purple, blue, green, blue, purple, blue, green, blue, etc. So, oh my gosh, how do I wanna do this? And also, if I'm dividing things into four stripes, do I want the blues to both be the same length as the purple and green? Or do I want them to be smaller and let the 
color balance between the three colors be equal, but have the bluer stripes be thinner. Ooh, I'm gonna need to play around with this as I think. I decided to go for the four color stripe and that honestly meant laying out the yarn way easier because if I dye this section green, this section purple, and the middle section blue, well then our repeat will do the, the green, blue, purple, blue as we go around. If I wanted to do a three color um, skein, I would need to sort of pinch our thirds into the middle so that way things would continue around. But given that I probably should have added more ties, this felt a little bit tangled. <laughs> I think this works. And I'm realizing I should have prepared the skein and arranged it the way that I wanted with those color sections when it was in its neatest form right after I took it off the Nitty Naughty. It would have been way easier to do that dry than it is wet. Uh, but anyway, I think we're ready to go so we can go and I guess prep our colors. One other thing I would like to note is that when I put these little zip ties just to help me keep track, I'll loosen them eventually of where I want the colors. I moved the middle section for the blue is slightly longer than double either the pink or, the, or sorry the purple or the green section um, that way it gives a little bit more length there but it's approximately uh, for the total amount of yardage one to one to one for all the colors total approximately I'm gonna dye our yarn in mason jars today. These are 32 ounce mason jars, which means they each hold about four cups of water or approximately one liter. And so let's start adding our colors. And I'm realizing I should just put the blue in the middle. Uh, that would make the most sense. And I do want to rinse out the container. I am not measuring out the liquid. The goal is eventually to bring the liquid all like the total volume of liquid all the way up to the top of the jars but for starters I'm gonna aim to get it about half full now I have not added any acid here yet and as I pour in the dye that we mixed I'm rinsing out the dye cup so that way we can get all of that dye as possible the reason why my plan is to start off making each of these jars approximately half full is that then we have space to add our yarn and we can increase the volume. Now I'm adding no acid at the beginning because I want to slow down the rate that the color will strike to the yarn. Now we might see breaking, especially in our green and purple. Some of those blues can strike pretty quickly, but not the Caribbean blue. So hopefully adding that will help a little bit, but we'll add some acid after we've uh, had our yarn in here for a little bit. Now I need to see, can I lift them all at once? I need to decide if I want to move this into the pasta insert I plan to use to help heat set it. And I'm realizing that I should do that because now when it's time to heat set the yarn, what I can do is put this pasta insert inside a kettle, heat that up, and then that'll heat the liquid in the jars. It's just, by starting with them in here, it's a little bit less pretty. <laughs> uh, but I don't want to transfer things too much from one spot to another. Okay. Now I'm gonna start adding the yarn and let's start with the blue. And add the yarn in there. Let's add some to our green. I should probably go grab all those spoons back. I'm gonna remove, I hope I don't regret this, remove the zip tie. And we'll, again, I'll loosen these ties that are sort of in these middle areas at some point. Uh, so that way we can sort of pass color back and forth. Their purpose is to help us keep track of the different um, colors and approximately where I want them to be. Okay. 
and I'm bringing these in to just stir things up a bit. And now I'm gonna increase the water level. And I'm realizing as I do this, I may want to go ahead and bring over the dye kettle. <laughs> and it's not gonna be completely full of water yet, but I will put some water in it. Okay, here's our kettle. We will eventually add more water in. But now I have our yarn in here, and this way, if I accidentally overflow one of these, overfill one of these jars, well, then uh, I have some place for the liquid to go that isn't my counter. I need to remember that I do need space to add acid. Um, and these spoons will not be able to remain in here as I'm heating things up. We just want them in here to help me stir things up for now. And then all these areas that are sort of in the middle, oops, there we go. I'm gonna take one end, dip it into the green a little bit, take the other end, dip it into the blue. And so that's something that I'll do more of as time goes on. And again, I will loosen those zip ties as time goes on. Because you'll see the blue goes is over that section a little bit, but that shouldn't be a huge problem. Okay, stirring this up, nice. Now our colors are gonna be a little bit more muted than the sort of bright neon colors that were mixed because our bare yarn has this beautiful sort of oatmeal -y color to begin with. But now things, there's no heat, we still have no acid, but I am going to want to let things sit uh, for a little bit just to give some time for things to equilibrate. Now my tap water is slightly acidic, so I do sometimes see colors begin to strike when things are cold and have no acid in them. And so I'm not expecting with these colors in particular to see a lot of that color striking to our yarn, but the more time I do things and the slower we add the acid and then heat it, uh, the more even coverage we can get. But things in these mason jars are crowded, and so we will get tonal variation, or we should at least get tonal variation in there because the yarn's very scrunched up in there. But anyway, I will see you. I guess let's wait 15 minutes. Okay, before we add acid, let's go ahead and dunk these sides in. Ha, there was the timer. One more time. Oh dear. Hopefully I'm not tangling things too much. Pop that in. Pop in one side, then the other. Okay, again, I plan to loosen that. But now I wanna go ahead and stir, stir things before we start adding acid. And so we are gonna slowly, we'll start with the green, I'm adding a tablespoon of white vinegar, stirring it up. I'm gonna do the same thing with the blue. Caribbean blue is a color that can take some time to strike, which in our case today, that's a good thing. Okay, and the fluorescent pinks also are notorious for taking a while. Um, but just making sure we stir it up nice and good. So now before, I wanna add more acid, but I'm also going to, once again, slow things down. We're dunking either side of this yarn, getting some acid all over, but I'm gonna wait again because I'm doing this slowly so that way I don't add so much acid all at once that then we get massively uneven coverage. Again, it's not gonna be solid. Things are cramped. If I really wanted the most even coverage, I would dye each section one at a time in a huge kettle where the yarn could float more freely. Um, but I'm gonna wait, I think, just 10 minutes and then I'll add 
a lot more acid, I think, is my plan. I think I forgot to set a timer. Whoops. Okay. We're going to add another tablespoon of white vinegar to each of these colors. This time you may notice that I was doing this a little bit faster and I didn't stir first. Uh, but I will go ahead and dunk and dunk and dunk and dunk before we go ahead and do one more in each. This is a lot of acid, but it should be totally fine. Uh, too much acid doesn't hurt things and we will be washing the yarn in the end, so I'm not worried about that. Okay, stir this up. Okay, now I want to remove all, oh, I just added some green into the blue. It's not a big deal. Not a big deal. Okay, I am gonna bring this over to the stove now, which is easy to do because we are in the pot. I'm gonna turn on the heat, but you'll notice the water level is really, really low. So I'm gonna wanna increase that. You never want the jars to start floating, so slow and steady is pretty good. And while we're doing that, I can release our zip ties. You also want to make sure that you don't bring the water level uh, above the uh, water level of the pot. That would not be good. Now I am seeing a little bit of a spot <laughs> where our zip tie was, which means that that's good. That means that some color is striking already. But this is why we need to remove it because otherwise we'd get a resist mark in there, into the blue, into the pink. And as we're heating, I might go move things back and forth a little bit. Move this, yeah. We've got a demarcation line a little bit more into the blue, but it's okay if we have a tiny spot. I am surprised how quickly the color has struck. Now some of the colors may be a little more muted in the end than what I am anticipating because we have that silk content in our yarn, but I'm gonna move it sort of back in. I don't mind some more blue going into our green and purple, but I'm realizing I don't want the reverse. <laughs> but now it is gonna take a while for things to heat up. And I remembered one more thing I wanna do. And that is I can carefully fill these jars up. I know I'm blocking your few. A little bit more. There's no reason why there needs to be a gap. I have things arranged as close as I can, but I'm now going to cover this and we're going to heat things for an hour, I think, before I check in again. And part of the reason for waiting so long is that it's going to take time for things to heat up. And so once I start seeing a boil in the pot itself, then I will reduce the temperature I often don't end up seeing boiling within the jars when I do this, but they will warm up and the areas that are sort of in the middle, uh, they will get steamed because there'll be a lot of steam in here so that'll add more heat as well. So I'll see you in about an hour. I have reduced the heat to medium low, but we're definitely boiling at least in that outer area. But ooh, okay, the lens is too steamy. Look at our colors! It also looks like the yarn, screenshot, the yarn has moved up to the surface. And so I can see, okay, if I stick the spoon in, we've got a lot of pinks in here still. Rinse this off. As for our green, there's a little bit of yellow left. And then when it comes to our blues, a little bit of color left, but most of the color is in 
the yarn. Uh, what I'm gonna do now is turn off the heat and I'm gonna leave the lid off, but I'm gonna leave the yarn in here uh, to cool slowly because as it cools, we will absorb more of the pink dye and more of the blue dye. Both of those are colors that if you reheat yarn with those colors, that color will bleed again. Uh, at some point, we might remove the yarn from the dye bath and not uh, sort of get more of it in the yarn, but for now, it's about 11.30 a.m. Uh, we'll just wait a little bit and see where we end up. It's been about an hour and I'm feeling really impatient, but I have to say these three colors on this yarn base is stunning. Uh, what I'm gonna do now is, okay, the water level on these has decreased, which is nice. I'm gonna remove the insert. This is the other reason why this is handy. And I'm gonna bring this over to the sink because I know the insert is still warm. And there's a little bit of color in the water because I did spill a little bit. So that isn't anything concerning. It's so pretty. Okay, let me get an aluminum pan. I think what I'm gonna just do is lift. We do have some color left in all of them, but it's a lot less color. Oh, it's warm but not like absurdly hot. There's still a fair amount of liquid in the yarn, but for the first time we can get a view of this color combination, which the purple feels a lot more muted than I expected. The blue almost feels teal. Uh, it definitely is leaning teal, and then the green is sort of what I expected. I think that the bit of yellow in the yarn really did shift the colors. It made the purple a little bit more muted because of color wheel stuff. It added some green to our blue, but this is so pretty. I'm gonna let this finish cooling uh, so we can wash it. And I'm gonna want to try to separate things at some point so that way we could get a zip tie back on it. But actually it is cooling off pretty quickly. The yarn is fairly saturated, so the stuff on the bottom is taking longer. Before I start washing, I want to find aha, the loop. There we go. And what I'm going to do is carefully loop this around a couple times, so that way I have something that is a much more manageable size. There we go. We'll put our zip tie through, but all oh, these colors are so pretty. Okay, and we can put them into some water now. Before I add any soap, I'm not seeing any color come out. So I just added a little bit of some clear dish soap. So that way we can wash our yarn, but hopefully I picked the amount of dye. <laughs> We're at less than a 1% depth of shade. Uh, oof, it's so pretty, but I'm not seeing any bleeding. I was very hopeful. And you know, I'm curious, I, I'm gonna try to make a swatch. Um, hopefully I can do that before I need to ship out the yarn. But it does look like we got really good coverage uh, with all these colors and that we have a nice amount of contrast. It's subtle, but it works. I think it helps that the purple is a, ends up feeling a little bit deeper. But anyway, I'm gonna go put this through my spin dryer and hang it up to dry, so that way we can see what the finished yarn looks like. But I'm very curious, because of the silk content, if it's gonna feel a lot more pastel, uh, or how deep those colors feel. But I guess, <laughs> Compared to a sponge that is a little bit more like the blue that we started with, this is definitely a teal now. <laughs> I need to go lay out my mat so we can look at the whole skein. But here's our color progression. Woohoo! The green section, I think, is slightly longer than the purple, but not substantially. There is slightly more blue than green, but don't forget that each blue stripe will be about half of the size as either the purple or the green. Now I need to take this absolutely monster skein and wind it into a size that is more 
practical <laughs> and usable because this is too big to fit on a skein winder or anything like that. So I will be setting it up over the back of two chairs to slowly wind onto the uh, to wind onto the small nitty naughty. <laughs> now I do have two swifts, so in theory I could set one up here in the dining room and another up on the other side of the house, but I don't have a second table that is heavy enough, so that way a little bit of tension on the swift wouldn't cause like the chair or whatever it's on to tip over. So I'm gonna do the backs of two chairs off camera, and well, I'll come back in a minute. I used to do live streams where I would wind yarn onto the Nitty Nannies, but I just wanted to give you a sense of the speed with which I do this. But I can't do this while sitting down because I need to walk back and forth with the chair. <laughs> this is so pretty. The green definitely stands out though. I'm gonna remove it from the Nitty Naughty. I don't know where the other end is. I'll find that later because now I want to go knit a swatch. Here is a swatch of the yarn. I knit this in stockinette with 30 stitches across on size 2 uh, or 2.75 millimeter knitting needles. So if you were making a sock that was 60 stitches around, each of these stripes would be half of the size. And we have about four to five rows of our larger stripes and about two and a half rows of the blue. Oh, this is so pretty. But again, notice how thin the swatch is. So you won't get stripes that are this thick and juicy if you are making socks out of this yarn. I wish I had the capacity to show swatches for more of the yarn that I dye, but unfortunately it's just not possible. Plus, the type of pattern you get with a variegated yarn really does depend on your gauge, the number of stitches, whether you're knitting it back and forth or in the round, and there can be a lot of variety there. But with self-striping, I like to show this so you get a sense of how big those repeats are. Because if you want stripes that look like the swatch on socks, then you know, okay, and, you, and if you want that same four striping, four stripe pattern, you'll know that you want to start with a skein that is twice as big as what we had here, and you're going to want the length of each stripe to be twice as long as what we had here. So one way you can go and try to calculate this is knit a swatch that is the gauge you would use for your socks, and then unravel uh, the number of rows that you want the length of your stripe to be and measure that length. That'll tell you how long you need that section to be. And so you can sort of calculate everything else from there. I am Rebecca from Chemnitz and I would like to give another huge shout out and thank you to today's lab partner, Kara. Kara, I really hope that you have enjoyed this video. And I hope you're gonna really love knitting with this yarn. I will say it is soft and luxurious and I really did enjoy knitting the swatch and I can't wait to dive more of this blend in the future. If you would like to learn more about how you can become a lab partner like Kara, uh, go and check out the listings in the Chemnitz Creations Etsy shop. Lab partners get to pick a yarn base that I'll dye in an episode of Dye Pot Weekly. Uh, you can tell me some colors to avoid and I'll create a video with you in mind and you'll get shout outs and things along the way. The whole thing is fun and if you have a birthday or something coming up and you want me to see if I can get the video to come out around then, reach out to me a couple months ahead of time and if there's space in the schedule then I'll try to get the video around your birthday. But with anything like particular dates or if you have a particular idea or something that you would like to see, please reach out to me on Etsy in advance so we can chat about it before you go and make your purchase. Please subscribe and turn on notifications so you never miss a new video. I post at least twice a week. Some videos are a little shorter, some are a little longer like this one, but we all have a lot of fun playing with color and yarn. Thank you so much for watching.